I think there's a really positive thing in terms of artist education and music in terms of monetizing. On the other end, artists get so caught up in this conversation in this direction that they forget the first thing, which is you need to have fans to monetize in the first place. Would I say to that, if you don't put out the music or the thing that's the bait to keep fishing for those people, then nothing's ever going to grow to even getting to a monetization standpoint. We're not really fighting for monetization anymore. We're fighting for attention in this era. You're looking to just gain four new people, five new people with every piece of content you put out and stuff like that. And so one person at a time, man, you know what I mean? And eventually you turn around, you go, whoa, there's a thousand people there. Okay, bet, yo, y'all want this t-shirt? What's up, what's up, what's up? It's brand man, Sean. And I'm Corey. And we are back with another episode of No Labels Necessary Podcast. You can catch us anywhere you stream your podcast here at the intersection of creativity and currency. And you know when we do this special intro, we have a special individual mm -hmm. on the pod with us today. This We got somebody that I think in my head as like Mr. Everything. This guy is a producer, like a legit producer. Like, man, his stuff sounds great. Um, for real, for real, artist, a content creator. Um, he helps artists legitimately, and he has a career with some songs that have popped off, like, and they sound like, hey, they were fed by the labels, man. It's that level of quality, <laughs> which is crazy. We got to talk about that, though. It's a real thing. Welcome, none other than Devon Terrell. What's up with you, bro? Appreciate you being on. Thank you, man. I appreciate you fellas having me, man. I'm really, really glad uh, we finally kind of making this happen and stuff like that. I've been watching... Uh, you know, you guys for a while and, you know, Sean, I've seen your journey like from years ago back in the day uh, and stuff like that. So I, I just appreciate just, you know, kind of just being here with y'all and just talking, man. For, for. Appreciate yeah, it. man. Appreciate that big time, bro. Like, it's funny, like I, I heard of you over the years and then I started to look at your, your stuff like it would just be little things where you remember the, the app Loom? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I remember. I was talking to like one of the guys and you know about the platform and he wanted us to get on or start using it. He was like, "Oh yeah, Devon Terrell's on there. He's killing it." And I was like, "Oh man, who's Devon Terrell?" You know, that was pretty early on and everything. And I started checking you out a little bit then, and it was just like little moments, like like that man. You would just always pop up um, in different ways, and a lot of it would be you being early to a lot of things in, in comparison to other artists. So. I mean, I, I definitely want to go back because the way I look at you is you are, uh, I was talking to Ja'Cory about this, like one, you're legitimately in this indie space and you've been there for a good minute. You're like an OG as an artist in the indie space. But at the same time, the most perplexing part about this is there is no other R&B you. Most of the guys in this space like that are also helping people out online, giving them legit information and actually have real success. They're rappers. You know what I mean? Like um, in some form of fashion from the futuristics, uh, you know, Curtis King, just think about people that I like listen to or, or, or rock with, um, you know, just names like that. Those are people that I, that I hear. So like being an R and B artist, have you ever thought about that? And, and why are you in this space in particular in terms of just how you move as like an internet, a legit internet public figure? So, so you know, R&B is like, a, it's such a, it's such a niche, right? Like it, it just feels like such a niche these days, but I just feel like people love R&B, you know what I mean? It's like the core of a lot of music and I love R&B, I've always been an R&B lover. And so I came into this entire thing on the internet and stuff through hip hop ironically, because hip hop was always like the very clicky, very, you know, youthful, very like popular thing to do and stuff like that. Granted, I love hip hop to death, but that's where I kind of got my footing on the internet was with hip hop and stuff. But, you know, at the core, I'm a singer, you know, and R&B was always my thing. And um, it just kind of just happened. Like, I'll be honest with you, I really haven't thought about it much. I have thought about it in a sense of it's not many like indie R&B, like that's not like a really big thing. Like that's not even a word I hear like, oh, indie R&B, you know what I mean? So yeah, I, I'm one of the, the 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 few people that I do see in the space. I know there's some other guys and girls as well, but um, yeah, I definitely like pride myself and I love R&B um, to death. Like R&B is my thing and, and you know, I just dip my toe in both sides, hip hop and R&B, but obviously mainly on face, from the face standpoint is just R&B and stuff like that. So yeah, haven't thought about it much. 
But um, it is something that has come up mentally sometimes where I'm like, it's not many, you know what I mean, in that space and stuff like that, in uh, in that niche. I think an important question for someone like you, right, that I consider to be, you know, successful in, in just the base level of funding your lifestyle as a creative at this point, and you've been doing it for years. I know when you first started, right, there's no way you could have imagined this path versus the more traditional label path, right? So I think the big question that helps a lot of artists is like, are you happy? Are you happy with how you're moving and the control and way your life is set up now versus maybe that initial vision of how you saw? I, you know, I'm, I'm very happy with my career, dude. Like, you know, contrary to what people may think and stuff like that, um, I really enjoy being just in full control, you know, of everything I have going on. Like, I could drop a song tomorrow. I could drop a song next week. I don't have to worry about just anyone or anything. Um, you know, I'm in a situation where I happen to find a distribution deal uh, as of right now that is just very indie. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, no one is telling me when I can't or and stuff like that. I just literally have a, a team, a label, a distro label that basically just supports, you know, it's like, Hey, y'all have a song coming out and you know, a week and a half, just make sure it gets pitched. Okay, cool. Like no one is saying you can't do that, you know, or my, I own all my masters for instance, and stuff like that. Like I am in full control of my entire career. And sometimes I don't think people realize how advantageous that is as opposed to being super famous, super hit records and then just being super stagnated from an artistic standpoint. Like that would eat me alive. That's what makes people really sad, man, is when it's like you can't feed your fans or you make this dope record and you're like, I need people to hear this now, but you have to go through so much red tape in order to get to you know, the end and stuff like that. So no, I'm in a good place, man, where I just feel like I get to feed my fan base and I just get to be free, you know? And great things happen, you know, in that and within that. And I can put out way more stuff than someone on a label. I can put out way more music and way more content than the average person um, on a label. It's so crazy you say that because I just talked about this, like I did like a video about it because we have like clients and just friends who have found themselves more and more into that space where the word really is legitimately free. And it's very common, the, the many of the things you just said, where it's like, I can drop whenever I want to, I could be as creative. And yes, I care about numbers. I want to see myself get like a lot of streams, but it's not any pressure. Like I'm not even looking at my music primarily even for money. That's what a lot of people are saying. I don't know if you're in particular that, in that space, but if you are somewhere near that, where it's like, okay, I got a lot of things set up and maybe I could do shows or however, you know, you, you, you make your money. But at the end of the day, I'm not like, oh, if I don't make sure I get to three thousand dollars a month from Spotify, I I'm not living. You know what I mean? Like, what is, what is it like to be in that position? Like, truly, from the point, you know, from the standpoint of being an artist and the part that you know that the the the, the part of it that you know that artists kind of like need to hear, really, to be straight up. What I'll say is I was lucky enough to be a part of what I deem as a golden era of uh, of independent music. And I feel like the golden era, and I mean, pe some people may kill me for this, was around, I'd say around like that 2013, 2014 into 2016, 17, like that five-year span. Reason why I say that is because that's when we were getting three checks. We were getting uh, hard sales, like hard physical sales, right, from iTunes. So obviously people were going buy albums. Yes, people did that for anyone uh, too young to understand that. Then there were people that were buying our physical CDs still. People still had CD players somewhat and or just loved it for memorabilia. So we was getting that check. And then we were getting this little check that none of us understood called streaming. And we were like, cool. Like we were getting three huge checks um, just from music. So I could drop a project, right? And know in my heart, first week I could probably make 30 grand. From, a fir from that project. First week, independently, first week I can make about 30 grand. And I know that over the span of the year, that project will probably make, just on just on sales, no touring, no merch, just on sales itself, I probably can make around $125,000 uh, in that year off of that project, right? So at that time, if I drop two projects, we're looking at a quarter million dollars, right? Like for two projects, independently, no, nope, I'm not talking about merch, None of these extra things. I'm just talking about on physical sale, just making money off of your music. 
So with that being said, what happened was I was making, we were making tons of money. Like, I'm just like, yo, I'm just going to do two projects a year. My life is set. That's all I got to do. I built my fan base. I went viral enough to accumulate those fans. It's a wrap. Okay. As time is progressing, we're starting to see, and I don't know if you noticed, that conversation of record sales are way down. Like, we started to see that conversation started to brew. And we all were confused because he was like, yo, I went from going 10K first week to 2,000 first week. Didn't understand that. What was happening was less people were buying hard copies of music, more people started to go towards the streaming path. So what we thought was the blessing in disguise was, okay, we're going to always get these, you know, three big checks forever. We didn't realize that the the hard sales uh, uh, income was going to diminish completely and go away. Then as more people got to streaming, there was less money in it. So now we're starting to get less money per streams. So all of that was happening and we all had to really figure out how the heck am I going to make money off of my music? So that's when you see more people going on tour, really having it to, to become like very physical and very like, and just figure out other ways to make money. For me in the beginning, it was those three things. I didn't have to tour. I literally could just make money off of my music. As time progressed, touring, I had to start doing more tours and stuff like that to make music. Then I had to pivot and start to figure out, okay, what's some other ways to make money to supplement for this album? Because the album doesn't recoup like it used to. So I started to have to do go more in the influencer ro uh, route where you saw me doing more stuff with brands, um, you know, really dipping into my publishing, trying to do sync uh, work, which I do a lot of sync work now for money um, as far as like TV, film, and things of that nature. So, you know, it just shifted. I think the hard thing was the digital, the hard sales going away and now just relying on streaming um, to really be the income driver for music in general. So brand partnerships, um, sync work, which is, you know, obviously TV and film. Of course, we still get, you know, our streaming money, which is cool. You know, it's not the greatest. And then, you know, on top of that, I just have the Help Me Devon side where I'm just kind of selling a bunch of other things and products and stuff like that, uh, you know, to have things just work in my favor and stuff like that. So it's really just taking your audience and figuring out how to monetize the audience now, not as much as what it was before, where it was like one person was worth $10. That's not what one person is worth anymore with a song, you know? So yeah, just, it was a big pivot, but that's kind of the ways that I, you know, kind of make money and stuff like that with merch and stuff like that as well. Yeah, I mean, that that's interesting, man. Cause yeah, so you were, you were able to move through the era where Hard physical sales were kind of the thing into more of this this digital monetization era. Which which era do you think was harder? The era now where artists have to kind of be content creators slash influencers, or was it? Do you think it was much harder moving like physical albums in that time period? So that's a dude. That's a great question. It's something I talk about with a lot of my um just indie friends all the time. Personally, personally for me, um I think it was a lot easier uh before. And the reason why I say it was a lot easier before is because. You know, I know someone can say, well, oh, yeah, but we have acts, you know, we get a bigger reach to all of these fans and stuff like that. But I say to people like this, what good is a million followers if you can't pay your rent? You know, like what what good is that as a musician where you're so stressed out and trying to figure out to how to make a living as opposed to, hey, I got 20,000 fans and I'm going on vacations. You know what I mean? So I think people look at numbers all wrong today where we see someone with 3 million followers and they're not able to monetize or figure out how to actually make money off of that 3 million people. Back in the day, you know, if I had, I know I had 20,000 diehard fans. If I got 10,000 of them to buy the album at $10, you know, the first week, dude, I was up. You know what I mean? Now, if I get 20,000 streams on a song, I mean, that's nothing. You know, that's a drop in a bucket. You know what I mean? That's, that's really nothing. So, now I can't invest as much as I would like into the album because it doesn't recoup as much. You know what I mean? And I have to find ways to kind of, I hate to say this, kind of bring down my expenses in order to make the business make sense of me investing, you know, in, in my music and stuff like that. So I think that's another way, a place where we kind of saw kind of like a, the quality of music started to change a bit too. You know what I mean? Because the the pool of money just changed for indie. Indie, I feel like the independent scene kind of dried up at one point. You know what I mean? Like it was really like it went from the funk volumes, Dizzy Wrights, Hobsons, Casey Veggies. Like it went from that to just kind of like it just shifted. Like it seemed like major label was the only way out again. Um, so yeah, man, just those errors have really taught me a lot. I think we're starting 
to find a nice rhythm again with the independent side. Um, but it's gonna take a little bit more time. But I'm I'm enjoying the spot that I'm at. Speaking for myself, for the myself, for the most part. I love that you said that because we don't think about the in between a lot. A lot of times we talk about old school selling out the trunk and then new school streaming. But you were in that middle where there was, you know, physicals, like you said, with a little bit of that virality from, the, that's the best, that, that's a beautiful space, man. That, I, I kind of see how you like, dang, man. Yeah, bro, it was, <laughs> it was money time. Bro, let me tell you, it was money time, bro. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it was, it was beautiful, it was bliss. And you know, for anyone that didn't experience that, you know, please take that with a grain of salt and you know please be careful how you judge what i said because if you weren't there and weren't experiencing it during that time my friend you have no idea you know what i mean like what that was like like to go viral back then it was over like you you were out of your sales hard sales people buying your songs it was a wrap like it was just a whole different world you know what i mean because that was the only way they could get more of it right yeah. It wasn't going to streaming. It's like, oh, I need, like, that pushes me over the paywall. I got to go find it because I want to hear it again. Exactly. It just, it, it put a little bit more of, it was less fleeting as far as fan bases. Mm. Meaning, like, as opposed to, what's this song? Okay, press play. It was, they had to, if they wanted it, they had to go here and, and grab it and pay for it. It was no other way, you know what I mean, to really do it. It's like, if I want this song, I got to pay 99 cents, you know? And so... I'd rather that person as opposed to the fleeting fan base of just catching me in passing. You know what I mean? And just kind of giving me that glaze. They had that $10 and they spent it on me, you know? So, yeah, it's it's just just different behavior and just different, you know, technology, man. It, it shifts things, man. That's why I pay attention to, like, tech and advances so much because it, it shifts things, like, tremendously. Yeah, and I do believe, like you said, we're catching a, a, a wave of, or it's the beginning of a wave to like bring a lot of the income back. I, I don't know if it'll be exactly what you just described, right? But it's gonna be better than where we've been in this last four or five years. Yes, four or five, yep. How do you view what an artist should get from their music? Because I'll, and I'll prompt it with my perspective. Mm -hmm. I think that we have an entitlement in how we view monetization around music because there's been these great moments of making a lot of money around music, but even, but before the commercialization of music and all, um, at all, like people weren't making money on music. Right. And, and the only reason I like to say it in that context is the best you could do and focus on is making the most out of your era. And then, you know, encouraging for a bet, you know, for better to exist. All right. All right. I got to take this quick second to make a major announcement. If you want personal help growing, I'm talking about getting a marketing campaign ran for you or a consultation for absolutely free from people who have done this. I'm talking about billions of streams under our belt, blowing up artists with content, advertising, PR campaigns, pre TikTok era, post TikTok era on all the platforms. We know how to do this and we have a limited opportunity for absolutely free. If you go to Contra Brand Agency, that's www.contra brand.agency. And you can check out the link in the description too. We have a limited opportunity for anybody signing up within the next 30 days to be considered for free consultation or marketing campaign with us, no strings attached, but it is first come first serve. So if I was you, I would sign up ASAP. Go to www.contrabrand.agency to be considered the earlier the better because we're only gonna be able to do this with a limited amount of people. Absolutely free though, for real. Back to this episode. Because you could, people before, you know, commercial music and people were just performing in, you know, jazz bars and stuff like that. Like that was just the money to be made, you know? And then that just is what it is. But then it became really popping in the late nineties and then 2000s happened. And then your era happened that you just came in on. And now, now we're here. And, and I feel like, you know, music is a luxury, although it's a need for those who love it so much. And, and I feel like if we, if we have that perspective, you you won't be able to, say well we should be able to make this because those people made that it's like nah we just got to focus on figuring our own thing out right now and that's that's basically what you know what we're all doing like I, you know me personally i'm not i'm not a complainer right like i say 
well, this is the era, this is the time, you know, it hurt, you know, as far as that transition, but nonetheless, yo, we gotta figure it out. You know, there are people making significant um, uh, amount of money, you know, right now, you know what I mean, through music. And I'm always also, you know, making sure I'm mindful of that. Like, okay, well, this is working for this person. How can I make it work for me? For instance, right now, I've created a, a subscription service for my fan bases, for my fan base, which I feel like is is kind of like, we starting something like with that, like that, that feels like the future. You know what I mean? As far as just like creating subscription services for your art, where the people that are the diehards that would like to support can support and you give them perks and you make it feel more personal for them. You give them exclusive songs, um, exclusive live streams. I feel like now we're starting to figure out how to really entertain our niche and really you know, go viral, you know, go with the Spotify's, all that, all that uh, finding that people can do now, but then trying to take the people that we found and kind of bringing them home and bringing them into like a world where, okay, I'm monetizing the diehards, you know, that's, that's really what I, I've been working on uh, for, the, for a while now, uh, recently, and uh, yeah, just turning it into a subscription service, and that's been, been really good so far, like it's starting to, you know, pick up and shift and people are starting to opt in and I'm seeing more artists do it. So I think that's like going to be a really big thing in the in the coming years uh, as far as everything is concerned. What do you, the only thing that concerns me about the subscription era is the fact that people already like feel like they're oversubscribed on some ways. And it's just a weird balance because we know that people are more willing to support us from a personal standpoint, they want to feel connected. But then what if, let's just pretend all artists have subscription services. Like now we start have to make decisions and now I'm hating on Devon, calling him like the, the same hate I used to get at labels, I'm giving to Devon now because he's winning. You know what I mean? Like how do you see that space in, in general evolving? Can I, can I be super honest with you? I'd, I'd love that. Because I'd love for a fan to have to decide who they want to invest in. Because yeah. that's going to separate your real fans from the from the ones that just really don't matter. You know, if this person, see it like this, if this person is a diehard fan, right? Like this person is the bane of my existence. I love Devon or whatever the artist is. And they have to decide what artists are they going to pick to, you know, be the artist that they give their money to. I want them to decide because now what we have just created is value, you know, because that $10 now they have to decide. It's not like I pay $10 a month and I have every song in the world. You know, you're not really you didn't really people are very funny. What What is free? And when they stream my song, it feels free. You know what I mean? Like it just feels free. It just feels like whatever. But if you paid ten dollars for it or you pay a dollar for it you're gonna be bumping this or you're gonna be you know what I'm saying like this we I think that that decision right there like literally what you're describing is exactly what music once was like it was a place of Beyonce is dropping and and uh Drake is dropping I got 20 I got ten dollars I gotta make a decision and that's what I want, you know? Now it's like, I did I put in enough work to prove to people this piece of music right here is valuable? Or, you know, do they feel like, you know, the other album was better? And so I want that, I want that decision. Like I want it. And I'm willing to fight for that decision as far as like, yo, I gotta make people and convince them this is the best piece of music that's coming out this week. Like that, you know, that that is what the economy was. And that's what I would like. I'd like that decision that you are forced to make as a as a fan yeah that's that's dope man because we we had a conversation about this one time where you know we talked about how sometimes the the artist's anger is misplaced and things that they think they should be mad at let's say the industry about or major labels about are are really more so a reflection of fan behavior and how fan behavior has changed right mm -hmm. and so what's interesting about it is that you know you can see the pathway to how music got to where it is today, right? Like I think about like, you know, not when I was growing up necessarily, but just younger, right? Like you think about, let's say the SoundCloud era, right? Everybody today is like, man, why do fans not value music as much? Why do fans, uh, are they, they are not as okay with paying for music? People forget, bro, the SoundCloud era was damn near the resurgence of like those Lil Wayne style drops where artists were just giving us a bunch of free music like really consistently. And what I think the artists at the time didn't think about because, you know, 
they don't have to deal with it the same way because by the time it really started to affect consumer mentality, they were the new superstars or the new the new big artists that didn't have to play by the rules. But that era of artists taught fans they're like, hey, like we as artists can pump out so much music for you that like you don't have to value it the same way. And so the conversation that me and Sean had one time was like, there is at some point going to have to be a, a collective of artists that, you know, for maybe, you know, it, it'd probably be detrimental to their career to a little bit, but it's, it, they're gonna have to band together and kind of push these new norms in order to change the the consumer behavior so that the artists two, three, four, five years from now are, are can, can start to kind of eat off of it in that way. So like what you're saying is like, is right, right? Like, yes, it will, it will bring back this competitive nature. I guess what you were saying, it will bring back this competitive nature amongst artists, but then the, the, the ripple effect that we have on the consumer mentality for the moment in the future will be, will be pretty massive, you know? Massive, super massive. And you know, as far as, you know, people, I don't blame fans. Cause if you told me, yo, for $10, you could have everything. Why wouldn't I do that? You know, like I, I don't blame them. Like, you know what I mean? I, <laughs> you know, I don't knock them at all for it. You know, it's just that it just had a ripple effect, like you said, on artistry and just kind of diminished the value of, you know, what we were kind of putting up and putting out there to the point where now it's a quantity quality game to me personally at this point. Like I have to have a certain amount of quantity, a couple with quality in order for me to like not sustain, but to it to be profitable, you know what I mean? And that takes a lot of work. Like, it takes a lot of work. Because I don't want to throw out a bunch of duds, you know what I mean? Or a bunch of music that I don't care about. But at the same time, I want to make sure that quality is still maintained. So it's, it's just a balance, man. It's just like a, just being a akin to the times, you know what I mean? Just kind of running with what, like, what they give us and stuff. But yeah, fan behavior has changed a lot. And we are learning. Personally, me, I'm learning every day. Like, I, every year, I have to, like, reiterate and change and figure things out so yeah man fame fan behavior is a big part of it it does change a lot of things yeah uh, i was gonna say what you said was actually a, a great argument to me on why people should not leave spotify completely i know some artists think about leaving spotify when spotify does something you know stupid as they might do <laughs> um but if we get back to the old era as you said like what a fan had to choose do i want music from this person or this person enough money to buy all of the albums that are out well how do i get to people right to even make them drive them to that point where they feel that way about me right so streaming is a big part of that content is another part of that right but those are just two ways versus you know how else would you do that back then it would have been like getting on a you know through a gatekeeped network right we don't have that anymore you know well we have it but you know what i mean so it, yeah. it, it goes back to you know content or Spotify, which just treats music like content, unfortunately. So I, I, I think it's it's very interesting that you draw that that line, but it's but it's pretty cool. And I think you you made me you reminded me that I I got somebody who's older that I work with. Um well and this is not even an artist. I'll just say this my I train I got my trainer um for like working out. He would tell me that he used to spend, it was either, I think he said at least a few hundred dollars a quarter on just buying albums because he was a music head. And he said, now he spends $10 a month, you know? <laughs> which, which is crazy. <laughs> like the amount of music, that the money that left the music ecosystem in terms of director artists. So I could see that coming back, you know, through whether it's a subscription or you know um, some artists are doing the one-off sales or the or the the pay what you you want like there's different versions of it right there's not there's multiple ways to monetize what do you think about monetization routes in general do you have a favorite um like subscription is one of them and of course there's others like do you have you know, spotify you can throw that in a bucket do you have a particular favorite as far as music streaming strictly like solely just music streaming Mm, let's say let's start the fan side because I know you you do sync right but like if you think about monetizing your fans so I can monetize my fans through subscription I could drop an album and say you have to buy this album but that's more of a one-off sale and even if I do that I could also say you pay what you want or I just give a straight price you know like there's just these different ways of providing your product to the fan and, and monetizing off of them directly do you have any particular favor or which ones have you maybe just experimented with and if, were there any pros and cons 
subscription one is becoming my favorite. Um, and the reason why it's becoming my favorite is because it's the most consistent. So yeah. it's my job to make sure that my fans are getting what they getting their money's worth. You understand what I'm saying? So whether that's like, okay, yo, y'all, I want y'all to pick my next single. Like, imagine your favorite artist, right? Is like, yo, I need y'all to help me pick my next single. We're going to do a live stream just for members only, and I want y'all to vote live right in there. I'm going to play y'all like five songs that aren't out, and let's vibe. You'd be like, yo, I'm, I, let's go. Like, if that's your favorite artist, right? If that's one of your favorite artists. You sit there, and we vibe, and I'm looking at the comments. It's just, let's say it's just 50 of us. Just, let's, let's just say it's 50 members. These are paid people. These are the diehard fans. And we're all checking. I'm like, oh, X373. You like th three? Okay. All right, cool. So I'm putting that at the top. Cool. And you're literally a part of like the entire experience of this artist's career. So I'll look in my comments of songs that came out and I'll see people like where I call my fan, fan base the weirdo company. I'll see people like the company heard this weeks ago. Like now they feel like I'm a part of this. Like when the public gets it, they're like, we've been on this. Like we had that. And that's kind of the culture I want to create. I want to create this a culture that feels exclusive, that feels like special. You know what I mean? For people that are really fans and start to separate those people that are just fleeting versus them. So subscription from a behavioral standpoint, since we're talking about fan behavior, is my favorite right now. Most lucrative though, I'll say at the moment, is Sync. Sync is probably the most lucrative um, version of it because one song could be licensed four times in a year. Let's say each license is 12 grand, uh, 12 times four, 12, 12, uh, 12, 24, 36, 40, that's 48 grand in a year for one song. So that kind of thing is, I mean, one song is not making me $50,000 just on the streaming side, unless it sells millions and millions and millions of streams. So the sync, I'd say is the most lucrative. So it's my favorite on the monetization side. But as far as a behavior thing and just as far as artistry, the subscription definitely has brought back a certain uh, uh, form of core fan base that I, I enjoyed from back in the day and stuff like that. Have you thought about doing a big paid drop for like someone like LaRussell? I, I think one of the projects he did like 150K in the first week, similar to the numbers that you were talking about from back in the day, right? Um, but it was just like, I'm doing a paid drop. I don't have a subscription ongoing community, but I'm saving up to this moment in time, I guess, to, you know, to be able to capitalize. Have you thought about doing any drops like that? Let's take a quick commercial break to talk about Spotify discovery mode. One of the most powerful tools when it comes to marketing music today, because it puts your music in the algorithm on Spotify to be listened to along with music similar to you without you having to run ads, without you having to do any content at all, which is why a lot of artists tell me they love it. But a lot of artists don't necessarily have access to Spotify discovery mode unless you're a two loss user. Because with two loss, all artists have a fair shot at getting access to Spotify discovery mode just by submitting through them and they pitch all of their artists music to Spotify to be considered for discovery mode. So if you don't meet the criteria, if you are in the position where some of the larger artists are, sign up for Two Lost Distribution at twolost.com. That's T-O-O lost.com because that's just one of many extremely valuable features that two loss offers to his artists to make their lives easier and you can try out two loss for free by using the code no label that's n-o-l-a-b-e-l when you sign up so go to two loss.com and check out how you can get your music heard everywhere it's actually done by a really good friend of mine there's a bunch of other like pretty popular um uh indie artists on it i know nick d is on it um, Mike Studded, well, Mike, just he calls himself Mike now. Mike is on it, Michael Minnelli, Futuristic. A bunch of indie artists are actually on the platform. And what we could do is, one, we could offer a subscription service, right? So I can say, uh, I'm charging you nine bucks a month to be a part of my paywall. Then there's a, I also offer a free version of my kind of membership where it's like, okay, well, if you join for with the free side, you get ABC. And then when I do drops, I can also do, hey, y'all, project's out, pay what you want. I can also still do all three of those. So for me personally, my members that pay per month, I gave it to them for free. I said, yo, the album is free for members. If you're already a paying member, let's say for three months, the album's free for you. But for the people that just want to say, listen, I just want a one-off. I just want to hear this right now. Pay what you want. And I can still set it up that way. So I think they all can exist in some capacity, you know? And now they got the perk of, yo, I'm hearing this album 
for free because I'm a, I'm a paid member. You know what I mean? I'm hearing this because I already pay. You know, I'm a part of this. I'm a member. I feel like I'm one of the, you know, I'm one of the people. I'm one of the people in the club, if that makes any sense. But if anybody else wants to hear it, they got to pay in um, and pay as you want. And then I can set a threshold for how much is the, you know, is the minimum. Like at minimum, four bucks if you want to hear it. You know what I mean? And that's it. But then some of my paid members will go and give me 50 bucks. You know, like here's 50. Like I just want to support. Like people forget, man. Like some people are actually really fans, man. They really want to support you. And I feel like we as artists should give them the opportunity to support, at least the opportunity, even if it's no one, at least give the opportunity. Like, look, this really helps me out. You know, if you would like to be a part of this, then please, I'll give you some extra stuff, free show tickets, um, which I'm planning to do and things of that nature. So it's just about making it feel special. But I'm doing all of those for the most part. Like I'm into all of those things. I love all of those. Got you. So yeah, I mean, so it wouldn't be like an all out, you don't get access, period, unless you pay for it. It will be more of a tiered access. Like if you don't, if you aren't subscribed, all right, cool. Then you you um you can you can pay for it to get access. If you are subscribed, you probably have it for free because that's just an ongoing perk and I want to keep showing love because you've shown me love, right? Pretty much, yeah, for sure. Especially if you know if I look at their their data and I see that they've been a paying member for five months and I'm like, okay, so they've given me fifty dollars already. And in my head, I'm like, yeah, here's the album. Like this is for you, and you're gonna continue paying. Now you're super gonna continue paying. Now I'm gonna make. You know, that one person is going to pay me $120 in a year. You know what I mean? One person, as opposed to, you know, 0 0.0038 of a cent, you know, uh, as far as like just streaming and stuff. I'll never get to $120 on that person. So now that person is more valuable, you know, within my fan base. Now I have a more, a higher valued customer, if that makes any sense, like in my fan base, which I hate to use the word customer when we're talking about fan bases in, in artistry. But from a business standpoint, that is a way that I can equate it so it makes sense for other people and stuff like that. I mean, I feel like that's the reality of what it is. I mean, I think about something that Andre 3000 said that kind of relates back to how I talked about like how music isn't, like the art is the art. There is no money that's attached that you should have just because you think you should have a certain amount of money, but there's a certain level of monetization that you have within given eras. And Andre alluded to this same idea based on the timing that a great artist might be able to make a certain level of impact and get credit. For instance, he's like, hey, he existed in his time and it was the right timing for a him, but the same him in an era before that or after that might not have hit, right? And every single era favors a certain type of artist. I feel like so there was like just straight recording artist eras. Like if you're all about the music deep into instrumentation production, there was an era for you, right? If you were really into certain niches or like especially the street artist era, there was er like eras for that. Today, I think the favored artist today is the marketer artist, the people who are self-promotional, understand um, or are more into business. And that's just a reality of the era. Unfortunately, the artists who are like, I just want to do music. I don't care about this and stuff. And, you know, they aren't interested in it. They, it's going to be hard to have a chance unless you have like a really great manager because a, a team. And, and and But that makes it still hard. Why? Because if I can't be like Devon, LaRussell, uh nick d futuristic if that's not like my mindset where i might be more like self-promotional or willing to do certain things business-wise then how am i then cool i might not be the ceo or like that leader i need a team but today they're not just picking up people off the streets who don't have anything going on so i still gotta be willing to do it to an extent for a manager to want to manage me unless it's just somebody who really sees and believes in me and for a label to want to sign me so it's, it's this really interesting conundrum that that we're in where it's like if you don't evolve to just see the business as a necessary thing you know what i mean i don't even want to call it an evil you know what right i, mean? I feel like, you i was thinking of that word too i was like it's like a necessary evil in a sense but but uh, i get it's just necessary yeah. to achieve the, the, if the art means that much they say look they say all artists have to suffer for their art i don't know how to to what extent but it isn't all right and in one area that might be suffering because everybody's taking your money but in this area that means you might just be suffering 
to make your money, right? <laughs> but and, and get to the and get to the people, but at least you get to keep the money. You know what I mean? Sure. Yeah. Independence to me, independence right now. It, I think it's gonna shift to an all time high uh, sooner or later. You know, with all the layoffs we're seeing at labels and stuff. Like I think, I think things are starting to come down to like numbers, man. Like heavy. And if you're not into the business side, I'll say this caveat to it. That's fine. You know, if you're like, listen, I just want to put out music and have fun. Have fun. Like you know, do your thing. But if you're trying to make a living. Now we're t I'm talking to those people. You know what I mean? I'm not talking to the person that's like, listen, I do it for the art. Beautiful man and girl. Like, shout out to you. I respect it. Cool. I have bills that I would like to be paid. And I would like to get what my music I feel is worth. You know, from a, mo from a monetary standpoint, right? Like, I would love to be able to make more music comfortably and just do what I want and try new things and stuff. And that comes with, you know, paying your bills, man. Like, I, you know, and I, that's, the, that's the weird balance where... I think it separates the those artists that are like I'm about the art. It's pure, blah blah. Me too. Like I'm totally for it. But you know, I man, I I love paying my bills too, man. Like I really enjoy that. And I don't think I as an artist should feel bad about that because that's not fair. You know, we work hard. You know, you work very hard to put these songs out. You work hard to put these melodies together. You spent years on your craft to get really good at it. And so to me, it's like. Yeah, man, I want to, I want to, I want to make money off of my music, off of what I do best. You know, like I just think that's just that just makes sense to me. So, yeah, just that part. <laughs> hey, well, I, I get it. We hear we hear these conversations all the time, and you know, every every artist has their own tendency, and you have to make the decision for yourself. But again, you know, like it's just gonna favor the more. The people who are willing to to move in a certain way when we get into the screen. And that's when I alluded to artists will be hating on other artists than, instead of labels, right? Because <laughs> they're not going to be wanting to do the, those those things or whatever. And you're like, man, this person's rich, but and, oh, because he's willing to sell out and make this type of video or he makes music that's for the algorithm. The things that we basically have already heard anyway, mm -hmm. all right? But, it, you know, it kind of just is what it is. Why not just work a regular job, though, and then make art on the side and not make any money for it um you know that's that's cool you know to me uh <laughs> is it is it really is it really i was like oh that's a tough one man you know and it's not once i will say this there's nothing wrong with that i'm i'm a very i'm very big on not making the nine to five such an evil thing like i'm very big on that there's, there's nothing wrong with that. People live amazing jobs and lives living nine to five. Some people live better than the other person that's like, I'm not going to do a nine to five. Well, the person working a nine to five is going on vacations, taking their family, you know, around places and living a wonderful life. So for me personally, I don't knock nine to fives. Nine to fives are great. If I didn't have a nine to five, I wouldn't be able to have this career that I've had. You understand what I'm saying? Because I was using my nine to five to invest into the music and trying to get that off the ground to be full time. For me personally, I like to do this. And this is what makes me happy. This is the career where eight hours will pass and I'll go, whoa, like I'm not tired. You know, I want to keep going. You understand? I can do this for 16 hours straight. And to me, that's how I know what I was destined to do or what truly uh, inspires me because I'm willing to do it for hours, bro. So when it comes to the, you know, nine to five, you know, I don't. I haven't found a job personally for me that brings me this much joy. You know what I mean? So, I've been doing this, you know, without a job for ten years. You know, as, as far as just monetizing my music and just making money on social media and stuff. And you know, it's it's afforded me a lot. You know what I mean? It's afforded me things, and I've been very blessed. So for me, you know, this is just what I love to do, man. And I, you know, I think everybody should get have a shot at least doing the thing that they love to do twenty four hours a day and to pay their bills with it. I just think that's the dream, man. Like, you know, like no matter what it is, I just think that that's the dream, man. I think that's what anybody would want. What do you love to do a lot? Whatever that big hobby of yours that you love, you like to play ball 24 seven. Wouldn't it be nice to be paid for it? Like, wouldn't you love getting up every morning and, and getting paid to do that job? That's, that's a beautiful life to me. So yeah, what's, what's great for me is doing music 24 seven. That's my, you know, that's what inspires me to wake up every day is just doing music. So I want to be paid for it. I mean, we've talked about I want to be paid for it. How you get the money in general, job, and all that stuff. I think there's a really positive thing in terms of artist education and music 
in terms of monetizing, right? And focusing more on money or understanding more on, on money and, and how to make more of it by going to your fans directly, right? On the other end, this is something that I've seen. Artists get so caught up in this conversation in this direction that they forget the first thing, which is you need to have fans to monetize in the first place. Right. It's just like, hey, man, I'm about to set up this thing and then sell this project. And I'm looking, I'm like, all right, you have literally two streams um, and you're telling me or in some cases it's like you don't have any uh, music out at all. Like, what do you say to artists? I don't like I know the point that isn't perfect for everybody. It's not like, Hey, when you get 500,000 streams, you should start thinking more about monetization or like that, that number we know isn't perfect, but I don't know. Like what are your thoughts on, on that in terms of like making sure you don't look to monetize so much. So like, all right, there's versions of it. One monetizing before you literally have fans at all. is like, bro, you're just going to not sell anything. And then two, you'd start to get to, there's another relationship of, looking to monetize so much that your fans don't have the chance to become fans because you're not even thinking about value adding, right? Whatever that looks like, you're just thinking to monetize, right? So you, you limit the growth that you can have. What I say to that, to someone starting, um, especially in this era is, and this is something that I try to explain to a lot of my friends and, they, and a lot of them don't listen. I say, hey man and girl, it's your music's never gonna be perfect, right? And by you holding on to all of that music that you have just in the gun until it's the right moment is really doing you an injustice as opposed to leading to growth. What I say is this. What if you dropped a song every single week, right? You're just starting out and you're dropping a song every single week. Let's say every week that gets you 10 more fans. Just that one song grabs you 10 new people every single week, 10 new people. By the end of that month, that's 40 new people you got, right? 40 new people, like 40 new people. We all know how growth works. It's exponential. 40 people yelling at the top of their lungs for you can become 80. 80 can become 160, except it can keep going, right? But if you don't put out the music or the thing that's the bait to keep fishing for those people, then nothing's ever going to grow to even getting to a monetization standpoint. What I say, and literally what I'm doing right now, at not saying even at my level, but even in, at, at this stage of my career, kind of re, re, revitalizing, rebranding myself is putting out a song every single week. And I'm slowly seeing Spotify numbers going up. I'm seeing my monthly listeners going up. I'm seeing more people hop into the uh, subscription service. Is because we're not really fighting for monetization anymore. We're fighting for attention in this era. And the way that I'm holding people's attention is by being here constantly. And that may work for some people and that might not work for others. But for me, I've just been looking at the artists that I've been seeing really killing it in this era. And I'm like, yo, I see them every week. Like I see them, con like I con I don't forget about them. You understand what I'm saying? They're always top of mind, always fresh music, always just, just in front of me. So what I say is with every single song you put out, and this goes back to that quality and quantity kind of game I'm talking about. You're looking to just gain four new people, five new people with every piece of content you put out and stuff like that. And so that's what I tell people today. And as far as what's working for me right now, it's constantly just putting things out and one one person at a time, man. You know what I mean? And eventually you turn around, you go, whoa, there's a thousand people there. Uh, Okay, bet. Yo, y'all want this t-shirt? 30 people, yes. Oh, bet. And you don't even realize it's happening. But if you just focus on the fact that you're just trying to get one person every single time, I think you'll notice that you'll have a better thing. I think everybody looks for that one viral moment or one hit. And so you that one hit, you put four months into it. And that was one song that got you a certain amount. And now that's it. You know what I mean? And then you're depressed because you put so much work into that project and it got 100 streams. And as opposed to taking that that those 12 songs and putting it out every single week, I bet you that has a better result for an unknown artist. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Man, so I, I want actually we need to talk about what you wanted to talk about. You know what I'm talking about? Oh yeah, yeah, the 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 group. 
the, the group no, fan base? No, no, we already talked about that. We we talking about the uh, the weird the branding. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. And that the fan base name. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, go yeah, ahead. no, but we were talking about this off camera, man. The the weirdo company. That's that's what you call. Is that just the name of the group? Or is that the name of the fan base as well? Yeah. Uh, so I always went by uh, Devon Toro, the Living Weirdo. Uh, that's pretty much where my whole fan base was predicated on. Uh, was that moniker of the Living Weirdo? So I've always, and of as of recent, I've shifted over to calling it the Weirdo Company. Um, and basically, that is our hashtag. That's our like entire thing. It's like the company. So it's I looked at the company. I love the idea of the company because I said, well, this is a network of people that believe in me right and they want more people to know about me so i started to take my fan base fan base and say okay cool well for if you want to be a free member of the weirdo company you're a part-time member and if you want to be a paid member you're a full-time member and full-time members get more access to things and they're more part of a company i just see my fan base or my supporters like a company i am at the helm of it i'm leading us in a certain direction trying to get our message across and then here are the full-time members that feel a part of it you know what i mean and that's what it that's what it's all about for me is just creating the experience and world of you know this is what the fan base is so now when i go to shows everybody's like yo bro i'm in the i'm in the company it's like oh bet okay cool 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 how long you been in the company for that's a culture you know what i'm saying like that's that's a real fan base to me you know what i mean when you're creating that culture where people just know this is our thing you know and that's it so yeah, I call it the Weirdo Company. I enjoy it. My fanship also enjoys it, and um, yeah, they buy merch and things of that nature because they want to support because they're a you know they're a part of something, which I'm very appreciative of, you know, and that's it. So I want them to feel like they're a part of something. Yeah. So what I was wondering, man, just from a, a brand perspective, right? You have the, you have the Living Weirdo, you have the, the Weird Company. You know, the word weird is not a word that I'm used to seeing be associated with R&B acts, right? R&B acts typically want to stay in the realm of like super cool or sexy or something in that space. But, you know, you branded yourself around this word that, like I said, is almost the complete opposite of that. What what was your what was your thinking behind that decision to kind of to kind of stick with that phrase and stick with that branding? And then I guess my my follow up question to that would be um do you feel like it makes you stick out for any particular reason when when it comes to like other R and B acts and, and the way they're kind of branding themselves? You absolutely. You know, here's here's what I'll say to you, right? The fact that we're having this conversation about the name of my brand tells you is is exactly why, right? Like for you, you're like, like why why like what is that? Like why are you the living weirdo? Like that's strange. Like that is what personally for me I want. Right. Like I want you to question things. I want you to um, look at all the spectrum of R&B or whatever the genre I'm in and go, what's that? Like that's isn't that what we want? You know what I mean? We want to stick out and we want to be different. You know, I could I could pick the coolest name on earth. You know what I mean? As far as an R&B act, as far as how R&B acts are portrayed. And we are the coolest people, you know, on earth as far as our genre is concerned. But for me, I'll be honest with you. I'm not the coolest guy in the world. I am not the smoothest dude. I'm goofy. I like to laugh. I like to be f playful and and that I want to be myself, man. You know like that's and I think that's what people know about me personally is like, dude, I'm not trying to be nothing else but myself every day. And some days I don't look that cool as far as what I do, me joking around with my moms or playing with my dog and making jokes and yeah, that's not atypical for I guess the average uh R&B act cuz it's all about being the coolest person in the room some, with some acts. But for me, man, I just felt like I just wanted to be true to myself and I didn't want to be something that I wasn't, you know, and that's it. And I think that's why I have the fan base I have, because I think they know I think they noticed that, you know, like, yo, dude, this dude is like me. Like he's wanting to be fun. And I'll see dudes being goofy, playing with my songs and stuff. Cool, bro. Like that's that's it is what it is, man. I'm not trying to be anything that I am not literally like that is the core of what I'll tell anyone. It's like, listen just there are people out there like you i promise maybe you don't see them but they're there like this is the internet people like you exist do not be afraid to be yourself and that's what my brand is all about just being yourself dude like straight up if you like content like this you'll love seeing our music marketing strategies that we use as an agency to actually blow up artists to millions and even billions of streams that are available for free at nolabelsnecessary.com and the cool part about it that's going to really make you love it is 
we don't have to be all entertaining and add all this fluff just to get some views that we do on YouTube. We get straight to the information. There's play by play in courses that give you a breakdown of every step that you should do to get success. And you have the ability to have communication with us. We get on live talks, a lot of cool things for members and it's free just to hop in. So check it out right now at nolabelsnecessary.com. And my fans are the nicest, bro. When I meet them, they are the most eccentric, most nicest, like nicest people I've like I ever meet, bro. I sit, I remember one time, and I don't know if I, this is okay to do, just to talk about this. I remember one time we had, after a show, my fans, uh, like my core group of my fans, I had them, I knew my, my full time, like my core group, I knew them. And they were like, yo, we're gonna get an Airbnb, we're gonna throw a party. I was like, bet, let's do it. And I knew this was my core fan base. And dog, we went, they had an Airbnb, it was lit. Nope, everything was cool. We party, I partied with them and chill. These are like the core, it's like a very exclusive kind of thing just for like the core fans. They booked it, they set it up, and I pulled up out of respect. I was like, yo, thank you. You know what I mean? And we were chilling. And they were cool, bro. They were super cool. You know what I mean? So I'm just with the people that relate to me. You know? That's it. It's, and, and, and it works. Yeah, that's that's good for you yeah. because of your personality. Because you're attracting those type of people. Because you could do that with your fans. But <laughs> if, you, if you're a certain type of artist, you don't want to do that with your fans. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lot of y'all can't do that. Right. Yeah, that's why I say this works for me. <laughs> don't do that. Because you got ops. A lot of y'all talk a lot of, you know, shit. Y'all can't be pulling up to no random spots, nah. Yeah, but that, that, that is what I like about the messaging though, right? Because I do think there are a lot of artists out there who don't realize that you can you can craft the world that attracts the people that you want to attract, right? Like I, I've seen so many artists get caught up in feeling like they have to live a certain lifestyle or, or look a type of image. And, you know, for a vast majority of people that doesn't work, but what doesn't get talked about enough is the group of people that it does work for, but then aren't happy in the position that they put themselves in or aren't happy with the types of, cause I've seen artists before say that, like they walk out to a show or maybe it's their first time ever like seeing their fan base in person. It's the first time they've realized like what type of people they've culminated around them. And every artist doesn't want to necessarily like move forward with that group of people, you know what I'm saying? And then, and then they're right back at square one trying to figure out how did I get here? And it comes down to what you said, you were basically living outside your truth or, or or you were doing things that that weren't honest to like what you would have to would want to positively deal with in real life you know absolutely at like you nailed it like right in the head bro like that's that's it it's it, you, it, it, <laughs> that is the biggest moment for an artist when you're doing your first show and you see your fan base and you're like these are the people like oh it's, it's interesting to see like this is what you're attracting absolutely so that's something the artist should keep in the back of their mind like who am i actually attracting you know, like that's big, like that's a big thing. So be careful with how you portray yourself, especially when you're not being yourself, like straight up. Yeah, will you like those people or not? Yeah. That, yeah. Do you, would you hang out with these people that you are attracting? Would you actually hang out with these people? Right. Yeah, I think it's a good way to put it too, right? Especially now where, you know, a lot of fan consumer behavior is the, the fan looking at artists as, as friends almost, right? I think we're in, we I won't say it's new. I, I I do believe in well actually I would say it's new. I think in other eras the fan to artist relationship was more of like idolization, right? Like I look up to you, you're bigger than life. Now it's almost like one to one, like I feel like I relate to you, I feel like we're friends. And so now with that mentality in mind, like, yeah, you're right, you have to think about it this way. Is this group of people a group of people that it, it, like you said, I was in a random city doing whatever thing I had to do. I would want to go hang out with those group of people. And I feel like the fact that we all could probably say that a vast majority of artists would say no to that. <laughs> a lot of what's wrong with the, the artist mentality sometimes when it comes to like building out their fan base and, and, and looking to attract whoever they want to build their, their business around. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, that that that's really big, man. Like who I who you attract is. It's important. And sometimes, honestly, you could be surprised. Also, I do want to give the caveat of you could be surprised at who you're attracting. But, you know, when you see who you're attracting, the beautiful thing is you start to get more insight into the psyche of this person when you meet them and go, oh, well, what do you do? And they're like, oh, well, I work at such and such. It's like, oh, wow, that's interesting. So it's like, this is so this is who I'm attracting. And then I learn more about that person. Now, for instance, uh, like a J. Cole record, like a big J. Cole record is Night Job. I'm at my night job. It's, it's, it, remember that, that record? Like I always laugh at that record because that record is huge amongst like workers that work the, the graveyard shift. 
Like, I noticed that. Like, I noticed dudes that do, like, the overnight stuff. They was like, yo, that was my, yo, I would be bumping that on my way to work at 12 at night, blah, blah. So, seeing that songs like that work, now I'm thinking to myself, oh, I have a blue collar kind of fan base also. So, let me start playing with, like, the nine to five kind of vibe. Like, you understand what I'm saying? Like, each fan, each thing leads me to, like, the next iteration of, like, my style of music and my aesthetic and stuff like that. So, bro... You, I always tell people, you put out the music when you're starting out. Put out the music because you have no idea who you are. Like, you have no idea who your fan base is. You have no idea who you're going to attract. But when you start to put out song by song and start to see, okay, I'm attracting this person, this person, this person. Let me sit and think about this. Okay. Oh, bet. So I'm making music for these type of people. Cool. Keep going. And you just keep iterating to kind of do it. Staying true to yourself, but kind of getting more inside of like the the cracks of like, what it is that you rep start to represent and you start to attract those people. So like, I like that night job record because it always throws me off. I'm like, yo, that was like a big record for like the people that worked in like uh, parking lots that worked at like overnight valets. Like, I don't know. It was big for that. Like I, every valet I know, that was they joint, bro. Like straight up. <laughs> yeah, man. I, I'm, I'm here, man. It's funny. I, I watched the music soul child interview artists. I, I rock with heavy. Um, he did an interview with R and B Money podcast with Tank, mm. and Tank was like, "Man, you know, I was I was supposed to be number one. My baby, I deserve record." And it was like, "But you, you were number one. I stayed at number two. He's like, and I'm up sitting here thinking, man, I took my shirt off and everything. This dude got his shirt on. He's number one." And music was like, "Yo, man, I I couldn't take my shirt off. That's why I didn't take my shirt off." Oh, and he was wow. like, "I couldn't do the record." of like, yo, I'm a player or, or anything like that. Cause I wasn't, I didn't have those relationships. Right. I, I was trying to get the relationships, right? right. So it was like a completely different perspective. And that's kind of what I got from you basically saying like, hey man, like this is who I am and this is where I speak from. Right. And all you can do is, or if you want to build something that you're more likely to love and long right. run, like show who you are, then find out who you are to the rest of the world because those are going to be the people you attract you're like oh okay this is what I, I i i connect with or who's connected with me right and then you start to you know build based on them because you have a bigger understanding of what it looks like at scale so exactly it really go through that process right yeah and that was boss it was also boss featuring j cole just to just to be clear shout out to boss because i love boss to death but it was boss yeah, featuring j cole that record mm -hmm. that night job but yeah bro it just you know as far as the fan base just like growing into it and kind of um yeah, like you said, the word acts like scaling it. That's like that's how you scale it. You see what works, and then you go, okay, keep punching it, just keep hitting it, and just keep growing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I want to switch directions because mm -hmm. we talked about your production earlier, like the fact that like if you listen to your records, knowing that that you've done, do you do, have you done all of them, or is there some that you haven't done? I'd say seven. I've produced seventy percent of my music, like most of it. I produced. I mix and master all of it. Every single song you ever heard, I mix and master all of them. Um, recording all of them. But as far as the production, I say I, I do seventy percent of the production. Like seventy percent of the songs you've heard, I've done the production on. Yeah, for sure, and produced. You're a hundred percenter. Oh, as far as like doing everything. Oh yeah, like I write it, record it, mix it. Yeah, like through the way. Studio with nothing. And then come out with a commercially viable track, like ready to be heard on the radio. Absolutely. The rarer thing. Mm -hmm. And but having that, right, a big part of that skill set, mm -hmm. you actually attribute to to um like going to college. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I you went to know. audio school. Mm-hmm. Like, and I remember you like said, because I was watching something and you like, yeah, you, you kind of like said that you intentionally went for that reason. A lot of people think of the music industry, you know, you don't need to go to college at all. You are somebody who is successful and you did go to college. I would love to hear your perspective on anybody who's, you know, thinking about that option these days. Right. You know what I tell people about college? You know, my biggest thing about college where I think people forget. I think people forget that you actually go to college to learn something, not to to say I got a degree. I went to college to learn a skill. Like straight up. I didn't care about the piece of paper. And I don't think a lot of people should care about the piece of paper unless you're going for for a career that is you need a certain certification like a lawyer, doctor. Of course you need that paper. But at the end of the day at the very core of it, 
I went to school to actually learn the skill. I didn't go for the actual piece of paper. I, I went to learn how to blank. So when it comes to college, what I tell anyone is, hey, if first ask yourself, what do you want? Where do you want to end up? Like, what is what do you want to figure out? If you say to yourself, yeah, I really want to be a tax attorney, then you're going to school to learn how, like the laws of tax law and how to balance uh, um, your books and managerial accounting and things like which I almost went into when I was younger. But you're going to learn that skill, not just for the piece of paper. And I think that gets lost in the translation of you got to go to college. You don't have to go to college because at the end of the day, I also say to people, there's also paths for certain careers to just intern and learn everything you need to learn. You know, for me at that time in my life, YouTube wasn't a thing like that. This was 07 that I went to college. Um, I'm older. I guess you could say I just told my age, but I was in college like 07. So there wasn't like a bunch of YouTube like videos that I could watch to learn about audio and stuff. I had to physically get inside of a place and learn how to do it. So school was my option. I didn't care about if I got another degree or anything. I just cared about learning. I wanted to learn the craft so that I can then take those skills and apply it to whatever I was trying to do. And that's it. So I think college works for some people. I think it doesn't work for others. But at the same time, I think at the very core, what we need to start saying out loud is, well, are you going to learn or, or are you going for a piece of paper uh, to just get certified in something or anything like that? Like, what is the core of what, why? Like, why are you going? You know, is, is what I say. Like, where are you trying to end up and why are you going is my biggest thing with college. So yeah, I don't knock it at all. It's expensive. So, and there's a lot of alternatives today, by the way. Now, I don't know if I would have did it now. Now? It's a wrap. I would have took some online courses and called it a day and learned this. Like, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, no, that definitely makes sense, man. <laughs> I, I feel I definitely want to get your perspective on it, though, because you, you are somebody who seemed like you actually got the value out of it. I did. Absolutely. But it worked when you found because also because you went intentionally to learn and lost saw it as a skill versus I'm just doing this and then I'm supposed to get a good job because of you know, whatever's at yeah. the end of the road. Yeah, no, no way. Yeah, I, I I didn't I didn't graduate college or go to college with the intention of I'm trying to get this fire job. I was going because I was trying to learn this skill because I knew if I knew how to do this, this thing that most people in the world don't know how to do, I knew that I would eat forever. So it's kind of like that, it's kind of like that analogy, and I'm going to butcher this analogy of bringing the horse to water, but you, but you can't make him drink it kind of thing. Or, sorry, give a man a fish and he'll eat for a day, but teach him how to fish and he'll eat, eat forever kind of thing. Like, that's what I was thinking when it came to engineering. I was like... Honestly, if I learn this, not only do I get to work on my own music and kill it, but I also get the caveat of I can make a quick 60 bucks mixing this guy's record or that girl's record or this. So now I got this skill set that also feeds me, you know, and that's where I was like, oh, this works like this. I could set up my life and force myself into a place of I eat what I kill. If I'm, you know, if I'm trying to get clients and I'm trying to record people, but at the same time, I also use my skill set for me as well. And Showing my music makes people go, yo, can you mix my stuff? Your stuff sounds dope. Oh, yeah, I got you. And I saw that. I was like, oh, if I get good at my own stuff, it'll be an easy sell to, you know, yo, I'll do yours. Give me 100 bucks, I'll do it. And that was big. 100 bucks back in 2000, still good money now, not saying that. But when I was younger, making $100 on a mix, bro, like that was like life changing. Like, you know what I mean? I was like, bro, like I'm making $100 sitting here, like it, at this desk, like that's insane. So, I saw that side of things as well, uh, as far as just learning the craft and monetizing it, if that makes any sense. I monetize my college education, if that makes any sense. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, man, that's perfect. Well, look, we, you, you, you've gone through all these iterations, yeah. and I, I can't let you get out of here without asking about like the more of the macro, your opinion on some of this macro stuff. Yeah. So, which direction I want to go? Let's start <laughs> with R and B in general. Ooh, okay. To <laughs> some TikTok for a preview for those who are listening. All right. Um, what do you think about the state of R and B in general? I think f f female R and B is top tier music. Like, just top tier, dog. Like, I think the I think the ladies have really elevated the genre. 
Like I, I and I, I want to shout them out because when I look at the male side, we're great. I think we do some amazing things. Like hands down, Kamar. Like there's so many people that I really enjoy on the male R and B side, Bryson's, um, uh, and stuff like that that I think are killing the game and doing a, an amazing job. But the ladies, man. The impact that like women R and B has had in the past couple years has just been just mind boggling, man. And it, and it keeps me hungry as a guy in R and B to be like, yo, like we gotta get like them. Like I see it as honestly, I see the women R and B is like big homie. Like the ladies is big homie right now. You know what I mean when it comes to R and B. So I look at the ladies and I'm like, yo, I'm trying to get like them. I'm not hating or anything. Like they make amazing stuff and they just speak for that audience that loves R&B so well. You know what I mean? And I'm trying to be, not saying a part of that, but I want to be, I want to be within that world, right? From an impact standpoint, where it's like, dang, man, like how, what is, what do I feel like, not is missing, but how can I elevate to that level of, of fanship and, and audience and, and, um, and acclaim, you know what I mean, as far as my music and stuff like that. So I feel like the guys... I don't, I don't think we're going, I don't want to say, we're, and this is a very heavy topic, so I want to be very careful because I really love R&B, especially, you know, male and female R&B. I feel like the guys are having a moment in time where we're figuring things out, you know, where I say like there's a transition of us that is trying to figure out, for the most part, what it is that appeals for, to a more mass audience. Brent Fiez, prime example. That boy is doing like 90s vibes R&B. You know what I mean? Like that, that, and it's working. So I look at that and go, oh, Brent. Okay, Brent figured something out. Bet. I look at Bryson. I go, oh, Bryson figured out. I look at the lucky days. I go, all right, cool. Like, here's our guys. Even like the Gibby on. Like, I'm, I'm looking at the landscape and I'm just seeing R&B. There's really, male R&B, there's really no like one kind of thing. Excluding Chris Brown, that's an anomaly. That is the most amazing, talented person on earth to me personally, like as far as Chris Brown. But I just feel like our landscape is dope, but I feel like we're figuring things out more or less. We're going to get there. Like, you know, but I just feel like the ladies, it's it's the ladies' time. Like, it's just the ladies' time, man. It's just the ladies' time and they're killing it. And I'm I'm all for it. And I'm I'm watching them from a big homie standpoint. Like, on they, they're the big homie. And I'm like, okay, what can I learn from them? You know what I mean? And stuff like that. So honestly, man. I really don't know. I genuinely don't. I really don't. If R&B is winning Grammys, like how Victoria Monet winning these huge accolades for the genre, then I have to look at that as a total win for the entire genre. I can't look at it as, dang, bro, the guys ain't winning. It's like, no, no, no. R&B is winning. We just got to figure out, as far as guys, where we belong in that space as well um, and things like that. SZA, Money long, money long. You know, like the, the girls are killing it. Summer Walk. I can name a bunch of girls, man, and they're all top tier artists. You know, so I can't really say, oh, the landscape is bad. It's like, no, I don't think so. I think the guys, we just gotta find our, you know, voice and and figure out our, our way within, like what's going on. Who's your R and B top five of all time, personally? Oh God, what a question. Okay, oh, top five R and B all time, bro. You know how you know how many arguments we gonna get in the comments. Oh. <laughs> Um, so I come from a certain era, so I want to be very clear on that. Um, so I'm going to say Usher for sure. Usher's top tier for me. Uh, he's a very big influence on my career personally. Um, oh man, I'm going to say Usher. I'm going to say, oh my God, I don't want to mess this up. I'm going to say Usher. I'm going to throw someone in that doesn't get the credit they deserve. I'm going to say T-Pain. Kill me if you want. Anyone can kill me if they want. I don't care. Uh, T-Pain is top five for me, songwriters and just artists in general. I love T-Pain. I love T-Pain, bro. Especially his whole influence. We don't got to talk about that. So I say Usher, T-Pain, which is wild. Um, oh, man. is Are groups okay as well? Go ahead, man. Okay. Yours. I was going to say 112. 112 okay. as a kid. could You can't... I, I can't deny that. Um... I'll say, oh my gosh, who else, man? I'm on the spot. Usher, one twelve, T Pain, such a weird list. I'm with it. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bite myself because I, in, you know how you, in a moment you're just like, bro, I'm gonna forget. I know I'm forgetting. Um, is it okay to put Mike in that, or is that just a cop out to put Mike in that? 
No, it's not a cop out. It is hard to see him as one specific genre. Okay, so let's take him out. Let's take him out. That's that's true. He is. That's what that's his roots. That's it is his roots. it is his roots. Um, and a lot of us took from him. Um, dang man, I, I, I'm gonna have more of a modern list. I, I'll tell you what, I'll take Michael Jackson out because I just feel like I just want to try to just let me take Michael Jackson out. So I'm gonna say Usher, T Pain. I'm gonna say 112. I'll say uh, Chris Brown for me also. I know that's a more modern um, person, but I I feel like not, I, I feel like not enough people put him there. You know what I mean? As far as musically and far as what his contribution and how when he started dancing, we all stopped dancing. Uh, I think I think <laughs> I think I think people don't uh, realize that. And then, um, man, if I just go back in time just a little bit, um, you mind if I look at my Spotify right quick? Because it's going to come right up if I just look at my Spotify right quick. One second. Sorry about that. Because mm -hmm. I'm going to kill myself if I don't remember uh, my what you call it. Uh-uh. <laughs> Cause this is going on wax, so I'm like, hold on, because it's really tough to say. Cause there's so many men, like, cause you know what it is. Cause I think about the era of like the John B's, the Genuines, the you know Erica Badu's, like all those people deserve so much, man. So it's so hard. Lauren Hill, um, dang man, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with Lauren. I'm gonna go with Lauren, and I know she just had. Not saying she just has that one album. I, I wish there was more music behind that, but I'm gonna go with Lauren off the strength of how impactful that project was, man. Like, like as a kid, like that project was everything for me. I love the Little Mo's. Like, like I even have like these little niches of people like your fan Little Mo. When I was younger, like was the one, bro. To this day, like Little Mo is like, but. Yeah, you know, I could say the Marvin Gaye's, the Al Greens and stuff, but as far as, and just to be honest, I'll say Usher, T-Pain, Chris Brown, Lauryn Hill, and um, I forgot who the fifth person I said. What was the other person? Oh, 112 and 112. Yeah, those are my people, you know? Kill me if you want. I love them to death. It's subjective, um, and that's what I enjoy. I love that list, man. I love that list. It's, it's, it's true to the brand, man. It's true to the brand, especially having, having T-Pain on there. Hey, see? I, I'm being right. honest. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Yeah. All right, let's, let's end on something a lot easier. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> With the potential ban on TikTok, mm. right? Yeah. Who I believe is going to legit be banned. Um, you know, I think it's a fair chance that it's going to be bought out if that really was what, what it came to. Yeah. Um, so we still have it. But if TikTok was banned, what do you think that impact would be? Um, and do you like it or not? I think the impact, I think it would surprise everyone. I think people would just, from a social media standpoint, just shift. I think that we would be on, sh I think YouTube shorts would go to the moon. I think that's who would see the biggest um, kind of like just pop is YouTube shorts. And you see I'm kind of skipping IG reels a bit because I feel like the energy and momentum that, I, that YouTube shorts has is really, really exponential. It's really taking off as far as YouTube shorts and stuff like that. And I think it's something that people are kind of like, not saying not paying attention to, but more or less just like, yeah, that's over there. But I think YouTube shorts would see a big, big pop. I think that all of those, that fan base would just shift because it would have to. They're not going to just stop creating content. I think who would benefit would be the IG Reels. I think um, YouTube shorts. And then I think that some other one would start to kind of like, bubble if that makes any sense but for the most part i think ig reels would start to pop off crazy and i think youtube shorts would be the biggest winner here out of tiktok what you call it all those influencers are just gonna shift to another social media platform like plain and simple until maybe something else comes about but i mean a social media platform popping off like a tiktok is one that's like lightning striking 12 times in one spot you know what i mean like and that's hard to say so yeah, I think that you we would see spillover. Like it would just be pure spillover. Even Facebook may have a little bit of a pop, you know, like with things. Yeah, yeah, I like that, man. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, people will figure things out. Oh, yeah. it might be figuring it out, but once it's figured out, it'll be back to it. There's so many things that have come like left in 
And then we found a new thing. Once you live long enough, you're like, dang, you know, I started to see restaurants and things about where I grew up and it's not there anymore. It's like, dang, it feels weird. Yeah. And then you start getting used to it. And TikTok just might be, you know, a Vine moment, except times 10, right? Right. <laughs> Shoot, you, yo, me and you thought the same thing. I was like, in my head, I was like, yo, Twitter, I'm not going to lie. If TikTok goes uh, up, man, it's y'all time. You know what I mean? Like y'all could, it, I would resurge that Vine. Just the pure idea of resurging Vine is enough to make people go, what's over? Let me see, you know? To me, if I was Twitter, I'd go to the biggest influence. If it, TikTok goes down, i go to the biggest influencers on TikTok and I literally be like, look, I'm going to put pay y'all and y'all are going to come and bring your audiences to, to, to Vine and let's just, let's just pick up where it left off. I would dead just try to do it that way from a business standpoint if I was them, uh, if I was Elon Musk. But that's if TikTok, I mean, this is a shot in the dark. It's if TikTok goes up a belly up, you know? Well, hey, man, well, I love that, bro. And I appreciate you stopping by. This conversation has been great in so many ways, man. Yeah. Always feel free to slide back through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This if if I'd, I'd be here anytime you, bro, anytime you have me, I, I'll be there. I love to be there in person, too. Maybe one time, you know, if wherever you guys are. I don't know where you guys are. Where you guys are? If that, is that okay to ask by any chance? City? That's off the pod conversation. Oh, my fault, my fault, OG. Yeah, see, but see, I knew, though. I said, yo, yo, where y'all at? I was like, yo, is that cool? But yeah. Wherever y'all at, I would love to stop by, pull up and stuff. Look, I'm trained. You can tell I like, I do this low key. Um, yeah, man, wherever you guys are, I would love to do this in person, maybe one time and uh, go from there. But yeah, man, I, I thank you for bringing me on the show. I really appreciate it. These conversations don't get had enough. And that's why I really appreciate your pl you guys' platform um, because I like to see these conversations, like real ones, you know, like happening from people that maybe people don't know much about. Um, and hearing like what it's like on the ground floor, you know what I mean? As far as like, Hey, this is what I'm dealing with as an independent artist. Maybe it can help someone and, um, you're not alone. It's okay. Kind of thing. So I appreciate y'all having these conversations, man. For real, for real. Thank you, man. Thank yeah. you. Appreciate it, man. Yeah, no doubt. Hey, this is yet another episode of No Labels Necessary. I'm Brandman Sean. And I'm Corey. And we out. Peace.